And then maybe an hour later, I hear this really loud cackling. <laughs> Welcome to Tell Me a Ghost Story, the late night call in podcast where we delve into the world of the supernatural and explore the eerie and unexplained. I'm your host, Michelle Newman. This podcast features true stories from our callers that will send shivers down your spine and leave you questioning the existence of the afterlife. So grab a cozy blanket. Turn down the lights. I'm Phil from Chattanooga. I'm a property manager. I manage empty, vacant, and foreclosed properties. And uh, this story happened in Noble, Georgia. I was given a work order to go to a town called Lafayette, Georgia. And uh, Noble was on the way, so I called a young man up that helps me from time to time. And he was home from the Marine Corps, so I picked him up, and he began to tell me uh, a story um, about what happened to him the night before, the afternoon before. He was going to take a shortcut from his house to his grandmother's house, and he had to go through the woods. And he said he'd gotten to a certain point, and he stopped, and he felt like he was being watched. And then he turned around, and there were these shadow figures uh, in back of him. And as he turned around, as he turned back forward, there were some shadow figures there again. And he began to tell me he did a 360, and they were all the way around him. And I asked him, I said, "What part of the woods were you in?" And he and he told me, he said, "You remember the old Tri-State Crematorium?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, that's that's in my backyard." He, he said, I was taking a shortcut, and I was going through the old crematorium. And I said, why in the shell would you do that? Because everybody around here knows that the guy who owned that place was not cremating bodies. He was piling them up in a barn. He had over 300 bodies that had not be, been cremated in his barn. And then when the FBI found out about it because of a neighbor's dog digging up a skull, the FBI, the GBI, state, local, all of that police just blew up that little town of Noble. And they tore everything down. They drained the pond. They took all the bodies that they could to Atlanta to try and, uh, you know, identify them. But the county and the state said nothing can be built on that property. So everything on there was torn down, like I said. And by now, everything's grown up and it's dense trees and scrub and privet. And he was taking a shortcut through there to get to his grandmother's house. And that's what he encountered on his way. You can fact check uh, the crematorium. It was called Tri-State Crematorium, Noble, Georgia. The man who owned it, name was Brent Marsh. Uh, pull it up and just take a look at... Uh, the chaos that was going on there. Just imagine the family secret is there's 300 rotting, decaying bodies out in the barn. Take a look at it. Thank you, Phil from Chattanooga. I recommend listeners Google the bizarre story of the tri-state crematorium scandal. In total, 334 bodies were recovered, out of which only 226 have been identified. Either way, I'd tell your friend to take the long way to Grandma's house from now on. Next message. Hey, this is Cynthia Catron again, KTRN. I'm calling from Avon, Indiana. And anyway, here's another true old story from the 1980s. One evening, we were at home in our living room watching the new color TV. Dad was so proud of that color TV. Suddenly, the power went off in the house, 
and the TV went off. And then my mom heard a growling sound. We had four dogs at the time and four cats, but they weren't doing anything. The dogs became frightened and ran out of the room. And my mom opened up the uh, living room drapes, and much to our horror, we saw the legendary creature called Dogman. He was six feet tall, and he was uh, completely black hair, and he looked like an American werewolf, and he was growling and snarling, and he was slapping the sliding glass door as if he was trying to break it, and Mom said to her, she called the police, and Dad said, no, I have a better idea. He said, werewolves are afraid of silver bullets, aren't they? And Mom said, but we haven't got a gun, and we haven't got silver bullets. And Dad said, I got something better. He ran into his bedroom, took out a silver coin chest, and presented it to the American werewolf, better known as Dogman. And it took one look at that and fled and howled and ran into the darkness. So I hope you get to share my stories. These are all true stories. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, for your call. I've never heard of the dog man before, so I had to look him up. In folklore, the Michigan dog man, it was described as a seven foot tall, blue eyed or amber eyed, bipedal canine like animal with a torso of a man and a fearsome howl that sounds like a human scream. In 1987, disc jockey Steve Cook in Traverse City, Michigan, recorded a silly song titled The Legend about a dog man, which he initially played as an April Fool's joke. He based the song on myths and legends from around North America and had never actually heard about the Michigan dog man at the time. He said he completely made up the song as a joke, from his own imagination. But then Cook started receiving calls from listeners who said that they had encountered a similar creature. And over the years, Cook has received more than a hundred reports of real Dogman sightings. Next caller. Hey, this is Hendel from Long Island, New York, and I have a ghost story for you all today. This ghost story happened a few years ago in a hostel that I was staying at in Los Angeles. Uh, It took place over the course of three days. The first day that I get to the hostel, first off, let me set the scene. It's a big room filled with bunk beds that could fit up to six to eight people. The first day that I get there, uh, I had a couple of roommates and everybody was very chill. You know, there were no signs of anything crazy going on. Um, So it was just a nice space. And then like, it was my first time staying at a hostel in Los Angeles. Uh, But already I had known of different hostels being haunted. So the second day, a couple of those roommates leave and it's just me and another girl who stayed there that night. When I come into the hostel at the end of the conference day, I showered, brushed my teeth, got ready for bed and turned off the light. Now the girl, she was scrolling on her phone And then maybe an hour later, I hear this really loud cackling. (laughs) Like she's giggling at her phone, but like really loudly, almost obnoxiously. Her head was near my feet where I heard this loud cackling noise. And I just tried to like begin to sleep it off, but she was just really loud. So I would say I gave it maybe 15 minutes and the cackling finally stopped. And then it's used badly. I put the flash on my phone on, but she, her head was the in the opposite direction. Where, where? How do I explain this? Um, so essentially, her feet were near my feet. So there was no way for her to have been laughing that loudly. Completely switched her position three hundred and sixty, and be in the position that she was in now. So to me, that was a very creepy moment, uh, almost impossible moment, but I shrugged it off and went to sleep. 
the following night, uh, so the girl had left, and now the room was full with about seven people, all staying in the bunk beds. And I came in at the end of the night of the conference, and I showered, I brushed my teeth, went to sleep, and I had been asleep for maybe five or ten minutes when I woke up, and I want to say this was around 1, 1.30 a.m. I just felt the entire room shaking. And but like shaking extremely hard and everything in the room was shaking because it, it was an earthquake. And like I'm, I'm watching like my body bounce on the bed and like every, every just everything in the room is shaking. So that lasted for about 20 seconds and then it stopped. And I said to myself, well, I mean, it's Los Angeles. You hear of earthquakes over here all the time. So I went back to sleep. The next morning, woke up, uh, went down to reception and I asked them, yeah, I think I asked for a towel and I said, you know, just casually, Hey, did everybody else feel that earthquake yesterday, last night? And they looked, they just looked at me with a blank stare, like what earthquake? (laughs) And so then I looked online, I looked at geological, you know, trackers, just everything. And there was no earthquake that happened in that area or in Los Angeles that day. Now, I think either incident could be dismissed as an occurrence, right? That the first occurrence could have been, I don't know, maybe maybe the girl just really did shift her entire body the opposite way after laughing really loudly on the phone, right? That could be plausible. The second one could be, Maybe I had dreamt that there was an earthquake. But to me, the fact that each of these incidents happened back to back, you know, night after night, to me just seems like a very supernatural phenomena happened at that hostel. Thank you, Hendel, for calling in. People are always coming and going from hostels. You never know who or what could stay behind. That's all we have this week, folks. Do you have a ghost story? Call 701-484-2666. That's 701-484-2666. Or go to tellmeaghoststory.com and leave your story there. Go ahead and leave me a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. Was something particularly scary in this episode? Or maybe you've had a similar experience. Leave your comments via our Spotify page. Thank you to all the callers who left messages this week. And as always, I'm your host, Michelle Newman, signing off. See you next week. What could be that?